if what I try and communicate here works, then you should at some point see clearly that having a meditation practice is essential to your well-being. Uh, and one of the things that I say about meditation, you know, is it, is it the case that without meditation you can't wake up? Is it the case that without meditation you can't realize your true nature? No. It's possible to realize your true nature without practicing med meditation. It's unlikely. It's improbable, you know, because most of us are, are, are living in a thought world. Most of us are living in a conditioned state. Uh, so much, that's so much the case that given that condition and given the fact that it is, uh, it's insidious in the sense that part of the condition is that you think that the voice in your head is you. Part of, that's part of the condition. You think that your feelings are legitimate. You know, most people think that their emotions are valid when, when mo very seldom is that the case. Most people think that the thoughts that they have are inherently uh, already valid. This is so important to understand that if you look at your life, I mean, if, you, if you've been practicing meditation and you take this seriously and the, and the teachings have gotten through to you, uh, then one of the things that you will come to understand is that prior to having some insight into the situation, you didn't know the difference between you and the voice in your head. And you believed everything it told you without any question about it at all. That's crazy. That's so crazy. I mean, when you look at that, it's so crazy. Just because you have a thought about something, it's considered to be true. We relate to thinking as if the thinking is reflecting the facts of the situation, don't we? Yeah, we relate to what we think like it's not just what I think, it's the truth. What I think is true, right? This is so much the case that it explains conflict between people because both people think that the thoughts they're having are the truth. And if the thoughts I'm having are the truth, and the feelings I have about those thoughts are true, and you're having a different set of thoughts, and you have a different set of feelings about your thoughts, and you consider that to be true, how do we proceed? How do we proceed? So th this is, uh, until that starts to open up, until you start to have some insight into that, you're a robot. You're a machine, you know, you're a conditioned, you know, Ramesh Balsakar says you're a three-dimensional object. <laughs> the human beings are a three-dimensional object. So the significance of this understanding is profound. You know, when you start to allow yourself to examine your life, when you start to allow yourself to examine what's going on up here, and to examine what's happening emotionally for you, and to understand the relationship between those thoughts, those feelings, and your behaviors, when you start to examine that, it's a psychotherapeutic process. You know, when people come to psychotherapy, that's basically what we're doing, is examining their life, examining their thinking, examining their emotions, and examining their behaviors, and looking to see, does what you think and what you feel and how you act work? Does it or doesn't it? And, and what is your state of being? What is your state of being? Do you have a state of being? Most people don't have a state of being, right? They have a state of emotions. They have a mental state and an emotional state. But most people don't have a state of being. That's, that's hidden from view. That's in the background and it's, and it's, it's unrecognized. The, that which has no form, that's, that which is not active, you know, that, that which occurs in a way that's not obvious to people, that's not part of their conditioned way of understanding what's happening, doesn't show up. That, that, no matter how true the truth is, right, if your conditioning is running the show, the conditioning is the truth for you. The conditioning is the truth for you. And so if you start to wake up, what does that mean? It means that you start to pay attention in such a way where you're not, now you're not just blindly going through the motions of your life anymore. You're not just blindly repeating the same patterns again and again, not getting anywhere. The quality of your life 
you know, one of the things that I think is important for anybody to ask themselves and to be brutally honest in the answer is, you know, what condition are you in? I mean, really, are you happy? Are you satisfied? Are you at peace? Or is your life coping and struggling and trying to change? Is your life involve com does your life involve conflict? Are you resisting your life? When you wake up in the morning, are you happy to be alive or, or do you dread the idea that you're gonna have to go through another day of life? If you're brutally honest about that, most people would have to admit they're not happy. You know, the pursuit of happiness, I mean, the, the pursuit of happiness is something we talk about as if we all understand that we're not happy. That, you know, that, that's, there's no question first. There's no question about are you happy or not, and if you're not happy, then there's a pursuit of happiness. No, there's no question first. The assumption is we're all unhappy, and so pursuing happiness is what we're all up to. And not only is it what we're all up to, but we've been conditioned to understand that a happiness is to be found by getting what we want, isn't it? Is, isn't that the culture we live in, you know? Not only, hap and not only is happiness to be found by getting what you want, but now happiness is to be found by getting what you want immediately, <laughs> right? We don't want to wait. You know, I said in one of the other classes, everybody wants to have an, an Amazon existence. You know, everybody wants to be able to, to get what you want as soon as possible without any problems about it, you know, and get it at a good price, you know. And, and so, so that's the carrot for humanity, you know, is people are chasing a circumstance, aren't they? People are chasing a particular situation. You, you know, you, you, it, it, in your mind's eye, you have some kind, of under, some, kind of, some kind of standard that you're trying to fulfill on. You know, if I had that, if I had that, if it was like that, if my wife was like that, if my kids were like that, if I was like that, if I was better at you know, being a decent human being that does the right thing all the time, I'd be happy, but I'm not. I'm not, neither is anybody else that I know. And then if I look at the news, it, it, it confounds the situation because then you get evidence that the, the whole world is, 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 is suffering from the same form of insanity. So what to do, what to do? So it is the case that there are people who under the right pressure, under the right circumstances, like Eckhart Tolle is one, you know, that woke up when he was about to kill himself. Okay? Or Ramana Maharshi was freaked out about death you know, and so he was so terrified about the idea. When he realized he was gonna die, this was the story with the Buddha too. When he realized he was gonna die, it's like, is, is that true? Is that, the, is that the way this works? Is that, you know, you live a certain amount of time and, and if you're lucky not to get killed or not to die from a disease, you end up dying anyway? Nobody survives life. Is that true? Is that the way it really is? When the Buddha went outside of the palace and saw old people and people suffering from illness and people dying, it blew his mind. It's like, wow, is this what life is? And so he dedicated himself from that point on to get an answer to the question, is there something beyond this life? Is there something other than the suffering that is involved in this life, and particular the, particularly the suffering that's involved in this life, given the condition that we're in. Given the, I mean, he didn't realize it at the time, but that was a big part of the problem, the condition that we're in. And so some people like uh, uh, Eckhart Tolle, uh, and there are other people who had awakening experiences under, uh, under pressure, so that happens, but then people, you know, people hope and pray that that happens to them, you know. Uh, that's an unrealistic approach because it's not likely. Uh, maybe if you get so desperate that you're about to kill yourself, you might have a shot at it, or you might just kill yourself instead. <laughs> but uh, for most of us, that's unrealistic to look at it that way. It's more realistic to understand that uh, it, while it's not the case that meditation is, uh, is, is an absolute necessity, 
you know, to realize the truth, to wake up, to be happy, to be satisfied, and to be peaceful. While it's not a necessity, uh, it does provide a way that increases the probability of success. Why? Because what are we doing in meditation? Where we are becoming aware of the physiology and the nervous system, we're paying attention and, uh, and we come to an understanding that we're in a contracted condition here. The body's in a contracted condition here. Actually, the, the birth of a human being is a contraction. It's a contraction, you know? It, it, you know it's, a, it's a dispersion of the energy and, and then all of a sudden that energy contracts into the fetus. So, so the, the, human, the human birth is a contraction and then on top of that, uh, the human body reacts to stress in such a way where it keeps preparing to fight or run again and again and again until it's doing that so consistently. This is neurosis. It's doing that so consistently that it doesn't realize it's doing it anymore. It's doing it so consistently it doesn't feel the, the, the stress in the body. It doesn't feel it anymore because anything that's a constant goes on, gets ignored, doesn't it? Your breath is a constant. You only pay attention to it when, you, when you're practicing meditation for the most part. So anything that's a constant, it doesn't show up. So if your body's in a constant state of stress, you, you don't experience it anymore because it's that way all the time. And then you wonder why you can't get to sleep, right? So in meditation, we're, we're becoming more aware of the physiology and the nervous system. And as we become aware of that, we're aware of the fact that we need to practice letting that relax, letting that, letting that energy relax and you know there and then so that's one part of it is relaxing the physiology the nervous system the other part of it is relaxing the mental state that's that's why it's very unlikely that you're going to uh, realize the truth given the condition you're in mentally is because the condition you're in mentally is you're depending on a program that is designed for survival to make you happy it's not designed to make you happy it's designed for survival Right? So you, you're depending on that to make you happy, and anything that happens around you that, the, that you interpret as a threat to your well-being or a threat to your happiness or a threat to your peace, right? you either run or attack. And if that's your wife or your husband, that's not gonna, that's not gonna go well, right? Or if it's anybody, it's not gonna go well. You know, if you go into the Wawa and start screaming, you know, how come this coffee is so goddamn hot? You know, it could go bad. You know, it could go bad fast. So, so what we're practicing here is waking up. What does waking up mean? It means, it means coming to the understanding, developing the insight that there is an, an awake, aware possibility that's unrealized. Coming to the, developing the insight or coming to the understanding that there is awake, alive, relaxed, calm, state of existence that's possible in which, it, in which we can experience happiness and a sense of satisfaction and well-being. So that as you continue to do these practices and study the teachings, it should start to occur to you that what you should be, what you should be holding in front of you all the time, the lens that you should start to look through instead of the lens of your conditioning, should be the lens of the possibility. And the, and the possibility is tranquility and transcendental wisdom. Tranquility and transcendental wisdom. So as you get further along in this process, you know, in the beginning, um, as Rupert says, there are concessions, right? Uh, the concessions are that, that, that I will say things that will be understandable given where you're at with this. But then once you understand that and you work with that for a while, you know, then there's another level and you take it to the next level, right? And if you continue to go through this process, the time will come when it's important for you to realize that you're not at odds with your personality. It, there is a point in this process that being at odds with your personality is a workable way of understanding things, right? Because your personality is your conditioning then your conditioning is not a workable uh, way of being in the world. Your conditioning is not a workable way of being in the world. So uh, in this process, there, there is a time in this process that to see how that's not serving you is important. 
to stop listening to the voice in your head that is expressing your conditioning is important, right? But then as you continue to go further along, because we're heading towards non-duality, right? It, when you're dealing with your personality, you know, that you discover that you're the awareness, you're aware of the personality, and you're dealing with the personality, that's still a dualistic situation. The truth is non-dual, so we know there's more, there's more road to travel here, there's more path to travel here, right? So if you want to head towards non-duality, at some point, you have to come to an understanding that the personality and the awareness are not different. The personality is the awareness. You know, my teacher said it's the awareness in drag, and it got him in trouble. Somebody got up and walked out and said, how dare you? <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's the awareness, it's the awareness that had to forget itself in order to exist in the world. This is, if, if, if you look at this, you can understand it. You, you can't be in this world as awareness. It doesn't work. The awareness has no form. It has no shape. It, it's not going anywhere. It's timeless. It's, you know, it just is. You can't, uh, you, that, that doesn't show up. You can't show up as nothing. You can't show up as space. Right? So the awareness had to forget its actual nature in order to be in the world and have a human life. It had to forget. It had to identify with the body and it had to identify with the personality and it had to see the world as a world that's separate from you and it had to see the world as a, as a time-space phenomena. Then you're in the world. Okay. However, if you're in the world that way, you've fallen from grace, you see. If you're in the world that way, you've been thrown out of the Garden of Eden. Okay? All these myths are about the same thing. Right? And so it's possible to remember your true nature, but first you have to be good at being the separate self. Right? First you, first you have to learn how to be civilized. First you have to learn how to get on in the world somehow. Right? And then, once that's established sufficiently, right? then it becomes possible to understand that what the Buddha was pointing to when he said that life is suffering, he was pointing to life is suffering for somebody who is being a person and a personality and doesn't know their true nature. For them, life is suffering, right? Why? Because impermanence is a factor of life for that person. They're going to die. Life is suffering because they're going to have physical pain. Life is, and they're not, it's not just because they're having physical pain that they're suffering. They're having physical pain and they believe that shouldn't be happening. That's the suffering. Right? So you can't go with the way things are. You have to, you, you know, you learn to fight it. You learn to cope with it. You learn to struggle with it. You learn to resist it. You learn to try and change it. You, try, you learn to try and keep improving it and keep improving your circumstances. Why? Because the circumstances determine the quality of your life. Right? That's, that is a failed a way of living. If your circumstances determine the quality of your life, that is a failed way of living. Why? Because you don't have control over the circumstances, and you never will. Right? So when the circumstances are good, you feel good. When the circumstances are bad, you feel bad. Right? And then you try and come up with some philosophical understanding of the whole situation that makes sense, so you can get more good, less bad. Your life becomes seeking pleasure, avoiding pain. And that doesn't work either, because you don't have enough control to determine the outcomes that way, right? So the practice of meditation allows us to calm the system down, calm the mind down, and, and if, that, if everything is calmer and there's less static and there's less activity in the way, you can start to see what you're looking at instead of what you think about what you're looking at. You can actually start seeing what you're looking at instead of just thinking about what you're looking at and reacting to it emotionally. So that's the process of meditation. You know, in Zen, one of the reasons that I've ended up becoming a Zen student and a Zen practitioner and a Zen teacher is because the word Zen means meditation. Why does it mean meditation? And why is Zen a sect of Buddhism that focuses primarily on meditation? Because meditation is a vehicle to, for realization. It's a process that if you commit yourself to over time, it promises to, 
to gradually open you up. It promises to gradually allow you to see things as they are. You know, they talk about in the teachings that if you wake up and you see things as they are, your mind becomes a mirror. Your mind, your, in other words, a mirror reflects things as they are. It doesn't change anything, right? Your mind becomes like a mirror. It reflects things as they actually are. Before that, you don't see things as they are. You see them based on the interpretation you make about them, and that's determined by your conditioning. So you, you're never, when you're using thinking and emotions to, 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 see, to, to see what's happening, when you're using thinking and emotions to see what's happening, you're not seeing what's happening. You're seeing an interpretation of it that's based on survival. In other words, you're always looking for a threat, right? The amygdala, which is a part of the brain, right? For people who practice meditation over time, the amygdala is a part of the brain that scientists tell us is constantly screening all incoming data to determine what's threatening to, 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 the, to the body, to the person, screening all incoming data. The, the only problem with it is that it, it's got corrupt data that it's using to do that. It considers anything that makes you look bad a threat to your existence. It considers anything that uh, is inconsistent with what you believe to be a threat to your existence. And in reality, it's not a threat to your existence. Most of what people consider to be a threat to them is not a threat to them. So, but the, so when people practice meditation over time and they're able to calm down and they're able to get the mind to calm down and they're able to start to see things more clearly, right? The amygdala shrinks. The amygdala of people who uh, have been practicing meditation for a long time is substantially smaller than people that don't practice meditation. So the brain does change. Meditation is hacking the brain, hacking the, the system. The central control of the entire system is being hacked. Okay? You know, they talk about, everybody's concerned about artificial intelligence, right? <laughs> we were talking about this at the retreat. And my teacher said, I don't get it. It's all artificial intelligence, <laughs> isn't it? What, you know, what, what does it mean by artificial intelligence? What does that mean? Does it mean by, that it's not natural intelligence? Well, then it's all artificial intelligence. Isn't all our intelligence artificial? Right? Artificial in the sense that it's not real. It's, it's, not the, it's not the kind of intelligence that's called transcendental wisdom. That's not what it is. It's learned information. It's information is what it is. You know? It's information. Artificial intelligence is just information. Right? But the thing that makes it so powerful and so valuable is that it can calculate and produce the, uh, it can calculate and produce answers to questions faster than you can think. Computers can think faster than a human being can think. Right? I think uh, I think I heard recently that uh, a computer um, beat the best chess player in the world. You know because it can compute you know, possibilities so fast, the brain can't, can't do it that fast. Right? But, but one of the things that we learn through meditation practice and through these teachings is that if you develop your natural state, if you develop your ability to be present to what's happening, and the resources you have to interact with it are coming from transcendental wisdom, in other words, beyond the database of your brain, right? If you can practice in a way to get access to what's beyond the database in your brain, then you can respond spontaneously to life in a very powerful, effective way without thinking about it. This is what they used to call in the, in the, in the East, samurai. You know, samurai were, tra were trained in such a way that they didn't have to, they didn't have to consider anything. You know, they're trained in such a way, if they, they, if they saw something, they respond immediately to it without any thought at all, right? This is something that can be developed in all of us, you know? A race car driver has, has developed it, you know, his ability to respond quickly, because if you're going 230 or 30 miles an hour, you have seconds to make corrections before you're dead. So this is a real possibility, and it's a real possibility for us to wake up and experience non-duality. You know, when I was sitting with my teacher in one of our uh, meetings, 
uh, he heard the geese flying outside the room, you know, and he turned and he said, that's me. That's a non-dual perception, you know. Non-duality means that you are realizing the truth, which is that you, there is no self. There is, there is no personality. Now, that is something that's an invention. It's an, it is, we talk about your personality as a self-image. What's the word image come from? Imagine, isn't it? So you've imagined what you are. And because uh, eight plus billion people imagined what they are, and their parents imagined it, and their parents imagined it, we just keep passing the imagined identity down to the next generation. And the agreement is so pervasive that this is reality. Now, how many people are walking around out there asking, who am I? You know, for, for most people, they consider that a stupid question. Why, you know, if, for, for, for your average person, if you said to them, do you know who you are? They'd say, well, why are you, why are you bothering me? <laughs> Why are you bothering me with that? What do you want to look? See, here, take, they'll, they'll show you the driver's license. <laughs> that's my ID, is my driver's license, right? So that's, it's interesting because we, the identity that we take ourselves to be is a physical body. If I ask you to remember something about your past, you will imagine your body, won't you? Yeah. You, so the brain has it that you're this physical body, and the brain has it that the personality and the physical body are basically the same thing in terms of the way you function in the world. So the point is that meditation and the point of my handing that, that sheet out to you is I want to be clear with us what this is. And if you progress to the point where you understand that your personality and the awareness are the same thing, uh, then you can start to be more effective in the way you're doing the work, right? You, start, you can start to be more effective in the way that you're doing the work because you begin to understand that your job is now to transform that personality, right, to be a, an image of the truth, to transform that personality to be an image of the reality of your true nature. What's that mean? You're practicing what the Dalai Lama keeps asking people to practice, compassion. Your true nature is compassion. Your true nature is love, unconditional. Love is your true nature. Your true nature is kindness, right? So when you're, when you're doing this work and you're practicing meditation and you get to a place where you understand your true nature and you understand that your personality w was a, 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 broken, a broken off area of, of the awareness, right? Now you want to bring it back. You want to... You want to um, mm, mm, you want, to, you want to love the personality. You, you want to help the personality heal its wounds. This is the inner child work, you know, to, to talk to the child that's still suffering within your nervous system and let it know that you love it and let it know that it can relax, that, it, that everything is okay. This is, this, is the, this is something that a lot of children never get never get somebody that, that's old enough and supposedly wise enough to tell them it's okay. You can cry if, you feel, if, you're, feeling, if you're suffering. You can cry, it's okay. Not, you're safe, it's okay to be you. It's okay to be who you really are. And if you didn't get that when you were a child, then you are the parent to the child within. You are the parent to the child that's in your nervous system that has material that's incomplete that has crying that hasn't been released, that has energy that hasn't been released. And this is why psychotherapy can be useful because you can start to investigate that and find out, you know, what's in your nervous system that's stuck there? What's incomplete for you? What do you need to say that you could never say? What do you need to feel that you could never feel? You know, so you can get everything cleaned up, you can get everything rebooted, you can get the system rebooted, you can get the corruption out of the system so that the system can start to function in a natural flow with the way things are happening, which is non-dual. You and the world are the same thing happening. When you're experiencing that, if you hear a geese squawk, that's you. 
uh, there are a lot of stories about monks and practitioners waking up when they hear a sudden sound, you know, because when they hear the sudden sound, they realize from a non in a non-dual sense, right, that everything is them. Everything that's happening is them. The world, you are the world. Remember that? We are the world years ago. You are the it's actually true. It's, if you have a non-dual experience, that's what you're experiencing. That there is no separation between you and the universe. You are the universe happening. 